Thanks, Nick. Uh, well, after those five presentations, I'm sure you've all got a lot of questions. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one which came to my mind, I thought the last time we used artillery in direct fire role was Le Cateau uh, in 1914, but it appears that uh, it was the main 15 in Gallipoli, which is tremendously interesting and for a whole variety of good reasons. And naval gunfire support, uh, it was tremendously interesting to hear what uh, David had to say about that and the efforts with radio equipment, uh, with all its problems and balloons and aircraft. And I'm sure a lot of lessons came out of that. So without further ado, uh, invite questions uh, from the audience, please. Yes, up the top there. Uh, Brigadier Robertson, uh, Jason Law. Just um, in your opinion, what would possess a commander who has superior numbers, momentum, um, to hold short of an objective uh, prior to actually seizing them? Uh, yes, yeah, Sinclair Camilla. Well, that's a fairly controversial uh, um, decision to take. Um, part of it's inexperience. I mean, he was his last command was a rifle company commander during the South African War and he was a temporary major in 1914. So he's elevated to brigade command. Uh, he gets absolutely no um, chance to exercise with his brigade, going through the, um, the war diaries and the training programs. Um, the brigade really only does individual training and some limited battalion exercises. So inexperience is the first thing. Secondly, he was quite against the uh, Gallipoli operation. He, um, he thought the covering force position was too great an extent for his brigade. Um, some people will argue, yes it was, others will argue, no it wasn't. Um, if you take in 1918, four Australian battalions held a 12 kilometre front that defeated two German divisions in a series of attacks. And, and some people don't understand that a covering position is not a defensive position. It's basically a delaying screen, uh, but it must be deep enough to enable the main body to disembark without being interfered with by the enemy. Uh, so he was against the Gallipoli operation. He, uh, he actually said to Bridges as he left the destroyer, I don't think you'll see the 3rd Brigade again. And he was concerned with his right flank, with the uh, Gabatepe uh, defences. What he didn't know, there was basically one field gun and a rifle company or a couple of rifle platoons down there. Um, it seems he made the decision as he came ashore because he told his brigade major to go forward and, and uh, take control of the front and didn't see him again until later in the morning. Uh, as Lieutenant Haig came up to push on to Third Ridge, the uh, brigade major told him to stay where he was, not to push forward. So it's a fairly controversial decision. Some people say that he did the right thing, um, but that predisposes that people know exactly what the Turks would do uh, when they counterattacked. But as you know, uh, war is an unpredictable thing and trying to say what people will do in battle doesn't always work out. My view is he made the wrong decision in doing that. Uh, in terms of artillery, it, it just absolutely gave the guns virtually no gun positions at all, no suitable gun positions, and it certainly gave the guns no room for manoeuvre. Thank you. Chris, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that thesis you advanced in your book, that you know, the time and space it took for the Turkish forces to respond. Mm -hmm. Offset against if Sinclair McLagan had, had some drive and initiative and determination, how it may have turned out. Yeah, well, the, uh, basically the Turkish defence consisted of a series of platoon posts. There was a platoon post 1,200 metres north of Anzac Cove, a platoon post uh, overlooking the cove, uh, a platoon post uh, south of the cove between Gabatepe and the cove on Bolton's Ridge. Uh, and then basically they had three rifle companies covering, or 750 men covering 12 kilometres of coastline. So it was a thin screen. Behind that, they held strong reserves. Uh, about eight kilometres, 10 kilometres inland uh, on the other side of the peninsula was the t rest of the 27th Regiment. 
Uh, it had uh, two battalions and a machine gun company. There were no machine, machine guns on the beach. That's uh, one of the big myths. The machine guns the Anzacs heard were actually the machine guns on the steam pinnaces that towed the boats ashore and open fire in the darkness. Uh, closer in, uh, just south of the Seri Bear Range, around Bogley, about five kilometres due east of the coast, was a Turkish division, but it was the 5th Army Reserve. So the whole aim of the Turkish division was to provide a thin screen uh, along the coast, certainly in the Anzac area, and then once they had determined where the attack was, they would deploy strong reserves to it. Now, the uh, 27th Reg Regimental Commander was ready to move at 5 a.m., but the Turks thought it was a feint, and they hold, told him to stop uh, and not deploy initially. He, he eventually headed off at 6 a.m., took him two hours to get to Third Ridge. By that stage, uh, at least three leading parties of Australians had got onto that ridge line, uh, one well to the south, uh, one just near Scrubby Knoll, and another group came up later, a couple of men came up later. So to my, uh, 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 the evidence seems to suggest if those fellows could get onto Third Ridge before the Turkish reinforcements arrived, there's no reason why a lot of the other brigade uh, couldn't have got up there. I've just come back from Gallipoli. If you, if you stand on Third Ridge and you look out, you're looking out on the lower slopes on a plain. And had they been able to open fire, they would have forced the 27th Regiment to deploy in an open plain and made their, uh, their, um, their attempts to, to thwart the Anzac landing much more difficult. But they didn't. And so the 27th came up behind Third Ridge, advanced north. The uh, leading elements got there about 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's a dispute there, some say 7.40, uh, but uh, Sheffick also said it took him two hours to get there. It took another hour for the column to close up. But uh, they were virtually unopposed. Uh, they cleared the small parties off uh, Third Ridge fairly quickly. So had Sinclair McLagan not halted... Uh, I think it's fairly sure that, that the bulk of the covering force could have secured the covering position along Third Ridge. Whether the Second Brigade could have then pushed up through the main range and captured the heights is questionable. I mean, it's beyond, you know, you can speculate, but I don't like to speculate. You have to have the evidence there. And the evidence is Australians got onto Third Ridge before the Turkish reinforcements arrived, and uh, uh, therefore, it's my view, Third Ridge could have been taken. Had Third Ridge been taken, it would have given the covering, the main body, more room to deploy. Um, people say, well, the Turks would have rolled us up, but that's assuming if they came around the south. Uh, Sheffick was intent on getting to the high ground. I mean, had he gone around to the south, he was in open ground. Uh, my view is uh, it's more likely he would have gone north, uh, but it would have made his job a lot harder. 19th Division was held. Uh, despite what Kemmel says, he moved off straight away. The Turkish sources showed that he didn't leave until about 8 o'clock. Uh, took a regiment and marched for the heights. Um, and he got to the heights before we did. So, uh, so basically, I don't think Anzac could have achieved its final objective, but it certainly could have had a much better position from which to conduct future operations had it pushed forward to Third Ridge. Thanks, Steve. Um, Brigadier Ashgar, uh, that was a fantastic presentation from you. I, I, you know, I, I, I knew absolutely nothing about uh, that, that particular aspect of, of our joint history, so uh, thank you very much for it. What I was a bit interested in is, is if you just tell us a bit more about um, how these... I, I noticed those two batteries actually go back to the 1800s, uh, I, I think, with their formation. Um, so, so that regiment sort of... Just a, a very sort of history of how how they came to where they were, and then what happened afterwards. I guess um, um, you know we'd have to go off too long, but but there were just some, you know some key key uh, things there. It's just an interesting story, it seems to me. Uh, thank you, Omar. Uh, these mountain batteries, uh, they have their own distinct history. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of mountain batteries, and uh, most of them are with Pakistan now. There are four with, uh, which are with Pakistan. Now, this first 26, uh, 26 Jacobs, uh, it was 
raised in 1826 as part of uh, Bombay uh, artillery, Golandas. And uh, the Kohat battery was raised in 1851. And the third battery, which, which uh, on orbit of my regiment is, that was in 1853. So these batteries used to <coughs> operate independently, and there's a great history to that. They were mostly deployed on punitive missions in the Fatah, where these days Pakistan army is fighting war against terrorism. So if I I go back, I can find out okay here my battery operated, here it operated. This was the operation. Okay, what is the resemblance of that operation with today's operation? I tell you, there are hundred percent similarities. When I go and I carry out, I used to carry out. I, I have uh, com been commanding in uh, war zone for one and a half year almost. And when I would go and uh, find out, uh, okay, well, carry out appreciation. Here should be a post, and I will go and I will find the British had already made a post there. Wow. So there's that. Okay. So these batteries used to operate independently. Now it was first time they fought first of one war, second of one war, <coughs> and after going to next century, they were for the first time they were made a seven artillery brigade. In 1910, so at that that was the time these two batteries came together, and they fought First World War. In Second World War, Thief Shower had joined them, so it became it became a 21st Mountain Regiment. And when Pakistan was uh, created, it became First Mountain Regiment. And as a mercy on them, they fought for 150 years in mountains. At mercy on them, they were recommended to be given self-propelled guns. <laughs> so. Today we are carrying it, those guns, and this is the only regiment in artillery which puts on red piping here. They have leather belt, they have distinction, they have a lot of pride. Every battery has a lot of pride, and we used to <coughs> celebrate Anzac Day until 1960. And uh, on Anzac Day, we will get a letter from uh, Australian government to re to remembering our soldiers, and from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, it broke down, yeah. and then since then, it's no more. Thank you. Thank you. It's coming. Hello, oh, Brigadier. Yeah, I very much enjoyed the presentation. I'm looking forward to Peter Stanley's book on the Indian Army's contribution to the Gallipoli campaign. It sounds quite good from his a presentation I went to visit a while back. It strikes me that the mountain batteries were particularly effective at Gallipoli, despite having very old guns, and were well suited to the terrain being experienced in mountain warfare. Were there other batteries that could have been deployed there? Because it seems to me a type of artillery that would have been very useful in greater numbers at Gallipoli. The question is regarding mountain artillery. Mountain artillery batteries, how they could have been used? Uh, could they have brought more into the theatre from elsewhere uh, to be used there? Ah, uh, well, these mountain batteries, uh, they was, uh, I told you they were staggered. And they, they were the only component which was sent by British, uh, British India uh, from Artillery. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was a problem going on. Uh, in most of the batteries where the Muslim, Muslim uh, soldiers were also there. And the Muslim soldiers were opposed to, you know, a campaign against Turkey. So when they were moved out of India, they were not given the clear orders. The orders were concealed. They were told, "Okay, move after you open the trap a couple of days." But you know, when they went into uh, the, the battlefield, then they fought for the cause of the regiment and the regimentation. Well, uh, they had the obsolete guns. They were they had fought about 50 years and about 75 years in the mountains. So the guns were also running out. So this is the maximum British uh, could spare. We better make this the uh, last question because I've been instructed to finish this at half past seven. So it's five hours. Thanks. Um, I, I read the Beans uh, history uh, about 40 years ago when I was asked to uh, write a history of the uh, of um, 108 battery. I never got round to to, uh, to writing it, but I, I, I loved uh, reading the books. But what really struck me was the, you know, the living conditions that these guys had to endure, that alone being shot at, and how they endured that. But one of the questions that comes to mind here is that the attrition rate, not only from uh, enemy action, but from 
the, the conditions on the peninsula must have been quite horrific. And to replace the gunners, a fairly a reasonably skilled trade, must have required quite a, a, a training and logistics um, organisation behind it. Was it capable of keeping up with the supply of trained manpower that was required through that uh, campaign? Look, I don't think it was only the gunners that uh, had trouble uh, keeping up reinforcements. Um, one of the things you've got to remember is that ANZAC was a pretty poorly trained force when it went to Gallipoli. Uh, you have infantry reinforcements being, uh, for example, enlisting in March, April and arriving on Gallipoli in August, early August. So, you know, they're less than three months trained, so the infantry uh, certainly had difficulty keeping up uh, reinforcements and I would say the gunners were pretty much in the same boat. Um, there, are, there are any number of accounts of people writing about reinforcements being trained on the beach at Anzac Cove, you know, being taken out of the line for more training. Um, this is a force that is learning its job while it's fighting. It's, um in the research that I've done, there, it was exactly that. In Alexandria, they were there and it was like volunteers, who wants to go forward and get over into the fight? And they put their hands up and it was actually on the job training at all times. Uh, and they did a great account of themselves and where the older gunners could be measured in, in weeks and, and a month, uh, they actually stood up and started to do that on the job training. Right, it's half past seven. I guess we've got to draw this to a close. Uh, could I thank you all for your attendance? I think it's quite heartening for the uh, historical company to see such an attendance at this the first seminar. On your behalf, I'd like to thank the four presenters who are here for really a, a stimulating set of presentations.